Yet agriculture is competing for the same land and water resources needed for these growing urban communities. Can the population of the U.S. compete with the urban growth and population change? According to an article written by Science Daily, the population of the United States will grow or double to more than half a billion people by the year 2050. To make room for this growth, the U.S. could lose one acre of land for every person added. That would mean that my family's small farm, along with several others, would be forced out of business. The demand for food will grow by 20%, and the demand for water will increase by 55. Farmers will have less water and less land to try and produce more food. Intensive farming will have to be used due to this loss of acreage. To the average American, that doesn't sound too bad, till you consider what this actually means. To produce heavy harvests, large amounts of water, fertilizer, and pesticides will be needed to force crops. This kind of crop management will eventually leave the soil infertile. With decreased grazing land, where does that leave our ranchers? Ranchers will have to raise more of their cattle in feedlot settings, eating mostly grain. Forcing these animals to spend up to half their lives confined in feedlots can cause all sorts of illnesses. In addition, the cost for producing cattle being fed grain is extremely expensive. With farming being the foundation of our existence, what is being done to ensure that it has a future? Over the last several years, federal and state agencies have put in place a number of zoning laws and programs to protect farmland. Alternative farming methods are also being explored to help ease the strains put on farming and ranching. Many scientists believe that crops grow hydroponically will be the way of the future. Hydroponic gardening uses plants grown in special water trays instead of soil. See, in traditional farming, the soil acts as the mineral nutrient holder. The soil itself, however, is not needed. As long as the plant's roots can get the right amount of nutrients, it can grow. A study conducted by Texas A&M University compared one acre worth of potatoes grown hydroponically to one acre of food grown. The differences in yields was amazing. The hydroponic method grew 60 two tons compared to the six tons of field grow. Water consumption in hydroponic gardening is significantly less. In a field corn crop, it took 175 gallons of water to produce enough for one pound of grain. The same crops grown hydroponically used one-tenth of that water. In addition, the water that was used can be recycled and used again. Probably the most interesting discovery in the use of hydroponics is producing livestock forage. A commercial grower out of California has developed a system that can grow a ton or more of livestock forage per day. Grain seeds are sprouted in seven to 10 days to form a thick carpet of grain fodder ready to harvest. This fodder doesn't take acres and acres of land to produce. The cost of fattening a cow on the hydroponic system would be an estimated $40 to $80 over a 90-day period. The cost to fatten the same animal on grain for 90 days would be roughly $350. The advantages for the future of farming and ranching with hydroponics are huge. But as with all good things, there are always some drawbacks. The disadvantage to the average small farmer interested in starting this type of farm is the initial cost. Production sheds can be expensive, and the most challenging part of the system is knowing the right formula of nutrients to add to the water. Can the future of agriculture compete with urban growth and population change? Yes, it can. The world is changing. We all must change with it, and farming is no exception. Our nation is realizing a need for a more efficient food production system, even though farming has become a less important way of life. It has, however, become a synergy for a movement spreading across America. 
scientists are focusing efforts on ways to double food, feed, fiber, and fuel on existing farmland. State legislation and community leaders are pushing for land conservation. There are momentous advances taking place every day in effort to use our resources more efficiently. With so much being done now, we can surely solve our problems. We've made great strides already in technology, that this is only a step in the right direction. In farming terms, we're already planting the seed. All we need to do now is help it grow. In the future, I hope to be reading headlines like these. Promising future for agriculture. Farmers use new and old technology to solve our food crisis. Family farming, alive and well. extremely blessed and I was able to have the chance of winning grand champion Houston Land this year and uh, this year has definitely been amazing. Had its ups and downs for sure, but it was, this year has been very, very blessed for me. Both of them were for uh, Texas Association of Counties, uh, the Honorable Jan Harlow, Wilson County, and one of them is for completion of five hours of instruction specific to the statutory requirements of the Texas Government Code, Chapter 2256.008 of the Public Funds Investment Act. And uh, the other is for a completion of 20 hours of educational instruction during the 41st Annual County Treasurer's Continuing Education Seminar. Congratulations. Okay. Not here. Item four is approved bond for Carolyn Leal Palacios. Motion, Commissioner Gomez. Second, Commissioner File. All in favor? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. August 26, 1997 to May 31, 2013. I'd like to thank him personally, myself, and thank you. Appreciate it. Turn the plaque around. I can't see the plaque. Turn your plaque around. Oh. Now that you retired, you can go to the fitness at the hospital. And do <laughs> Well, I'm happy to address the court now if you'd like to. 
For the record, my name is Robert Henderson. I'm Managing Director of Market City Capital Markets, and we have the uh, pleasure and honor of being the Managing Advisor for Wilson County. Um, based on conversations I had last week with the judge and the auditor, I was asked to do a couple of things. One was to uh, update the interest and sinking fund tax rate study. You guys may have noticed in the market in the last three or four weeks, we've seen an increase in interest rates. As a judge and Bernard can attest, I can speak to that subject for 45 minutes because uh, sometimes I like to sign my own voice. Uh, but the, the short version of this is that because of some uh, increasing, improving uh, leading economic indicators, a variety of Federal Reserve uh, Bank presidents, including uh, Ben Bernanke, who heads up of the Federal Reserve, uh, has indicated that contrary to prior uh, public statements regarding QE3, which is a quantitative easing three, the program by which the Federal Reserve is buying up to $80 billion a month in uh, securities in the secondary market in order to try to keep interest rates low, uh, it indicated they were going to be doing that at the end of 2013 uh, and possibly into the first quarter of 2014. Uh, recent indications are they're going to uh, stop that program. And as a consequence, just in the last two or three weeks, interest rates have gone up about 40 basis points. Well, we saw this happen in March and it came back to us, uh, but you just don't ever know. No one's got a crystal ball and we don't know what interest rates are going to be doing. Uh, the last time I was before the court, we had estimated the tax rate impact at $8.5 million at 3%. I've updated uh, those estimates to 3.5%, and you can see the tax rate impact would be about uh, 2.4 cents. Now keep in mind that historically, the county has had their outstanding debt service uh, and has had about a 1.3 cent INS tax rate in place, uh, including this year. So. Uh, we were talking about a one penny increase over your existing INS tax rate at today's interest rates. Uh, however, given the interest rate uh, direction, we're also providing a second estimate at 4.5%, uh, and the interest rate, uh, the tax rate impact then would be about 2.65 cents as opposed to 2.45 cents. So another 20 basis points, uh, and not 20 basis points, but uh, two tenths of one cent on your tax rate if in fact interest rates go up another percent. I know I talk fast, but the short version again, interest rates have gone up a little bit. You're looking at about a penny on your tax rate if you do with eight and a half million. If interest rates go up another percent above today, you're looking about a penny and a quarter above your existing tax rate. It appears that we're looking under that scenario that we're looking at through the term of this thing, an extra million four hundred thousand dollars in interest. Yes, sir. one one percent interest rate on eight and a half million turns into money. It does. Yeah. 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 Based on that, if we're going forward. We really ought to look at going forward. Well, and uh, the second thing we want to talk about is the timing of the issue, and and, and, and that really gets to your point, Commissioner. Uh, the longer we wait, I think the more likely this interest rates are going to be higher. We also <coughs> need to be concerned about the budget process and the tax rate adoption process that the court has to go through per state law and when you need to start that process in order to be able to levy a tax this year. With your permission, we, we can get into that. Um, the county is anticipating issuing certificates of obligation. Um, there was some legislation before the state house this spring that was going to extend the notice of uh, uh, requirements under the Certificate of Obligation Act, that legislation failed. So we are still looking at a 30-day notice of intent publication requirement. If the Commissioner's Court can reach a consensus today as to which direction they'd like to go, uh, we would come back on June the 24th and uh, approve what's called a formal notice of intent to issue Certificate of Obligation. It would include a not to exceed number. Uh, Verna asked about this Friday, or actually Saturday, while she was working. Uh, and, and I want to reemphasize it's a not to exceed number. Uh, if we were to put eight and a half million dollars in that notice, and as bids come in later in the month or early next month, if it turns out that you need less than eight and a half million, we can go ahead and sell less than eight and a half million without having to restart the process. We just simply can't issue more than that. 
Um, if we gave notice on, on 24th, or actually had the court approved giving notice, the notice has to be published in the newspapers twice, two consecutive weeks, the first publication being not less than 30 uh, days prior to the anticipated day of sale. So if you look at your schedule, if we approve the notice of intent on June 24th, we can publish it on July the 2nd, which will be the first publication date available in the local newspaper. Uh, 30 days after that, your next regular scheduled uh, commissioner's court meeting would be on uh, August the 12th. So we would actually be about 36 to 37 days. So we would be fine uh, on the uh, on the publication. If we sold on August the 12th, uh, we have to submit it to the Texas Attorney General's office for their approval. That process takes about three weeks. So we would generally expect to close about a month after the sale date. Uh, we would close, put money in the bank about uh, September the 4th. As you know, you're going to be adopting your budget in that same late August, early September uh, time frame and adopting your tax rate uh, sometime in September is the norm. So the debt per state law would be legally outstanding at the time that you adopted your tax rate, which would give you the authority to, to levy the INS tax rate required. I'm not a question, but I assume this functions like a line of credit. In no, the, no. Once we do it, it's a whole eight and a half. It, it, once you once you determine how much you're going to sell, you're selling all of it at one time. Okay. That way, you're it allows you to lock in the interest rate and avoid future interest rate risk. Okay. The debt would be sold off with what we call a ten-year par call feature, which means that you cannot pay the debt off or with or without penalty. You simply can't pay the debt off uh, for 10 years. But then at the end of 10 years, you can pay it off any time without a penalty. Now, if you find that you have more money than you really need, there's always more than one way to skin the cat. You can't pay the, 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 the debt off early. But you can take surplus funds and rebate it back to the taxpayers effectively by depositing it in the interest and sinking fund uh, account and, kind of, and lowering the INS tax rate uh, which, which basically gives the money back to the taxpayers. Another way to do it is to put extra money in the escrow account to, to fees the debt. That's really not a good option. The legal fees and the negative arbitrage, the difference between what you're going to earn in that escrow account and what you're paying on the bonds would, would well, not be good. So, so you're, you're ensuring the lender that for a 10-year period they will get their interest return in full. That's right. You will not accelerate in any form or fashion. Right. Securities Exchange Commission laws, and again, I teach this stuff, so I can talk about it all day. Uh, the Securities Exchange Commission laws require that, that the underwriters, in effect representing the county, guarantee the investors a certain yield to maturity. That's why you have to lock in at, at least for 10 years, this is not going to be called away from them. Because otherwise, you could be accused of uh, having them invest under false pretenses. You, you, you tell them you're going to give them three and a half percent, and then, you know, nine months later you take it back away from the Securities Exchange Commission doesn't like that sort of thing. Okay. So eventually, what you say, you know, we have to budget this for this year budget when we do the budget. Yes, sir. Because one of the things you, you want to avoid having happen is volatility in your tax rate. You're, you're paying off your existing debt this year. In fact, it is paid off. You, you paid it off early because you already had funds set aside. So if you do not sell the debt and adopt the tax rate this year, what's going to end up happening is, is your, your interest and seeking fund tax rate is going to drop about 1.35 cents. So the tax rate should see a decrease for one year and then go back up next year. So what we want to try to do is to have a, a, a level tax rate impact. Go ahead and get the debt issued this year so the tax rate doesn't fall, only to have to be increased twice as much next year. And when would the actual payment be? The first payment would be due February of 2014. So you'd levy your taxes in October 1 of 2013. Taxes become due January 31st of 2014. And you make your first payment February 15th of 2014 after you've had a chance to collect those taxes. Do you see uh, any way that a special meeting prior to the, the 24th would, would be beneficial or do you think you, you can proceed as rapidly from here as 
so far as my role in the transaction and the role of the bond attorney, we do not need another meeting. Now, whether or not you guys have gotten all the information you need to have from your architects and your construction managers and whomever, that's, Please, that's just, up to you guys. He just posted in the paper. Okay. So, you, so you've so you already made your decisions with respect to design specifications and all of that. So that there's, in that case, there really should not be another, another uh, requirement. Certainly not on our part. Um, one question in maybe. Like we're looking at the courthouse, the criminal justice facility, and the library. There's no place that this would be documented or anything. What I'm saying is, you're talking about if there's a surplus. Yeah. Uh, we've got a uh, obsolete uh, or uh, emergency management building mm -hmm. that that could you be utilized in there the surplus. Yes, sir. The the way the state law reads is that when you give notice of intent to issue certificates of obligation, and let me tell you, I practice law without a license, so. I'm not a lawyer for whoever's recording this, but I've been doing it for 30 years, so I kind of know what I'm doing. Uh, the way the state law reads, so when you give notice of intent to issue, you have to state the purposes for which the debt would be paid, and what you're issuing the debt for and what you're levying the tax for. So what we would say is we're making improvements to the county's existing courthouse, we're constructing new facilities, uh, you know, renovating this building, doing the library. We could include in that description Know, potential uh, improvements to the emergency uh, EMS facility. Uh, you state the purposes for which the debt would be sold. You don't break it down into individual amounts. We're going to say eight and a half million dollars for these three or four different purposes. We're not saying two million for this, three million for that. And that way, if there are surpluses in one category and deficiencies in the other, the Attorney General's office gives you the latitude to move that money back and forth. But you, you've met the state law requirement for telling your citizens what it is you're spending the money on. It's important that we identify all the potential uses for that money because if we, if we don't state right. something, then you, can. then you can't spend the money on that. You can only spend it on what you're saying and the notice you're spending it on. Well, I uh, want to say something also on that. Bit, uh, I know that if a uh, Eight and a half million dollars, uh, and I know that we got eight point one million dollars in the textbook. How come we can't take some money out of the textbook, at least half of it, and pay on this on this uh, debt that we're going to have and lower our our payment down? Well, there is. We're required by law to maintain twenty five percent. Of our reserve. operating budget as reserve, and so that 25 percent, depending on what our operating budget is, is somewhere in the three and a half million dollar range. Um, I, I know the county's a little more conservative, and they probably want us to maintain a little more than the bare minimum there. Um, the other thing is that text pool. We have pulled. Jan did pull some money out of there recently. Mm -hmm. uh, we collect. Most 90% of our property taxes early on, and then we, that goes into the tech pool, and then the tech pool, and we pull out money out as we need it. Um, there certainly is probably enough funds in there to, I would say, pull in two million, three million now easily without jeopardizing that fund. Of course, Jan's not here today to talk about it. She, she has more information on what she, when she pulls it out, how much she pulls out, that type of thing. Um, but we do have. So I'm just saying I'm going to lower that payment because that $577,000 is a big payment for it. And that's one of the reasons I asked about, you know, if we, do, if we borrow the full weight or if we don't borrow the full weight. Well, let me, let me address that in a couple of ways. First of all, conceptually, Burn is absolutely right. You want to maintain at least 25 percent if you want to get the highest possible bond rating so you get the lowest possible interest rate. And I would suggest a cushion above that 25 percent. When we first started this process, when I first started coming to visit the commissioners back in, in January, 
We talked about a three to five year capital improvement program. We talked about the court coming to kind of an understanding of what other capital improvement programs or projects that you might need in the next three to five years. We're talking about, aside from the, the items that, that have been put out the bid, do you need any county road work done? Do you need any bridge work done? Do you need any airport work done? I don't even know if you own I'm embarrassed to say, I don't know if you own your own airport, a lot of county too. So uh, I have no conceptual problem with drawing fund balances down to minimize this debt. I do think that we would want to think about and make sure before we do that that there aren't any other capital improvement projects that you see three to five years coming down the road besides the ones that this eight and a half million dollars covers. If there are none, I say by all means let's draw those fund balances down a little bit and reduce this debt a little bit. And that's the meaning that we had in now. I know for a fact right now there's an improvement for, especially for roads. It's a big issue right now. And we need to truly about what we get. Ain't enough funds to cover our, our road and bridges. I mean, I mean, I think that's basically what he's saying is if, if you see those coming down the road, you don't want to go into that tech school <coughs> and, and remove that money. You want to leave it for other capital project is that exactly because you don't want to come back in you know two years and borrow a million and a half dollars right it's not really cost effective to buy borrow small amounts of money and we all know you know that, that you've got the issue of the eagle for shale trucking that's, that's causing some some impact i mean the wood county judge thinks that the damage to his road is 400 million dollars now y'all only have that in one small part of the county although a lot of those service trucks are coming into forestville mm -hmm. so uh, I, I think that if, that if you're comfortable that you're not going to need to borrow any money for, for additional things, including these roads, we'll draw the money down. If you, if you think that you're going to have some road expenses uh, in the intermediate future, three to five years, then we probably ought to go ahead and borrow this eight and a half million dollars now while interest rates are low and save that cash to spend, you know, do your county roads on so you're not having to go back and do additional borrowing later. So when we do that, we have to put that money that we borrow also is going to be for road improvements or well we, we could put in the notice of intent we could add road improvements in there if you wanted to but what i'm saying is is that well, let's have a good handle on what your long your intermediate term capital needs are before we draw cash down because you may need some of that cash for for other and, and, and you don't have to designate textbook it's there now, that, yeah, the, the, your, your general fund reserves are available for any lawful purpose, so you don't have to designate it. It could be dog shelters, county roads, park, whatever it is that the commissioners now, call. Now, roughly, our, our debt service was like $300,000. Yes, $301,000. And, and what do you anticipate that going to? And I know what you, it, it depends on the interest rate, but yes. roughly, give it, can you give us some? Well, at, at, at eight and a half million and three and a half percent, we're looking at about five hundred and seventy-five thousand per year. So about that's about one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars a year more than your than historically paid. And, and uh, see, we we designated in this last budget five hundred thousand dollars towards the courthouse itself on that we did the last budget. Uh, but one, I agree with Commissioner Gomez about the the road and bridge budget. It's a maintenance budget, and that's really all. All that it is. If you, if you're lucky, you can manage your money, and it'll allow you to do some special projects. But it doesn't allow you to take it any further. Um, I personally think that um, we would be well served to go ahead and do the eight and a half million dollars, leaving the funds that we have in text pool for the most part there, because what we don't know. Uh, I don't think we're ever going to become DeWitt County or Carnes County, but we're getting more and more by the day. And so we don't know what the impact of that is going to be. At the same time, I brought to the court two or three times the fact that we have um, a fair amount of pavement within the county, subdivision or pavement for the most part, um, but some county uh, just county road pavement as well as that, that is going to need attention. And if we don't start dir directing our attention toward that, then we potentially have a huge problem down the road. So as opposed to paying this down and reducing the debt a bit, 
I would prefer to have the money there if we feel that we can reduce it, then let's take a look if we can do something for um, extending the life of our existing payment. And if at the end of this 10 year period, we have a significant amount of money in text pool, then that would be a good time to do a lump sum payment to bring it in. The payoffs will allow us to maybe do both and put ourselves in a position so that if we do have road problems, that we don't have to go out and try to do a bond or something for that. Um, so, to me, that, to, from my perspective. And the bottom line is, if we need money down the road, chances are it's never going to be as cheap as it is now. In interest it's rates are, are an extraordinarily low interest rates. And personally, you know, as a banker, do you borrow? Eight and eight and a half million and three and a half percent today versus say borrowing six and a half million and then you come back two years down the road and borrow another couple of million dollars at something closer to the 20 year historical average which would be probably around 5.2 5.1 uh, you know it's it it really I hate, hate to use the word, it's a phrase, but it really can become you know, six of one, six of one, half a dozen of the other in the final analysis. I, I do know that it costs money to go out and borrow money. You've got to pay lawyers, you've got to pay financial advisors, you've got to pay the Securities Exchange Commission, you've got to pay rating agencies, you've got to do bond documents, and it's really not terribly cost effective to. Um, borrow, you know, small amounts of money. I, I've got to be honest, so the other side of the coin is, and, and you know, Vernon knows this, text pool right now, interest rates are so low, text pool is only paying 25, 30 basis points. You're not making a lot of money. Uh, and, and so the, the difference would be that you're, you know, paying 3%, and, and this may be your point, but you're paying 3, 3.5% three interest on debt that's really you know, your offsetting balances are only earning a quarter of a percent. So again, I'm I'm not opposed if you've got a good handle on your three to five year capital improvement needs and you don't think that you're gonna need that money, I would not mathematically be opposed to, to see you pull down a couple million dollars and lower the debt at the size. So what you want to avoid though is doing that today and then turning around and having to borrow the money right back in a couple of years because your county roads are in bad shape. Well, I mean, we understand what, what the percentage is when you go borrow money, but the thing is that what if in five years or something revenue don't start coming in? Mm -hmm. How are we going to start? Are we going to start raising taxes? Did revenue pay, start coming in? Uh, coming down. Oh. You know, all the, what well, they say, the Eagle Four Chill and all the business that are coming in. What if it don't really come in in five years? Well, if you look in column B in this, we've actually only projected three, two and a half or three percent growth for a period of five or six years. So this is a very conservative analysis. In fact, given our timing at this point, we will know before you sell your debt because your county appraisal district on July the 25th is going to give you a certified tax for I fully expect it to come in better than 2.35 billion. And, and the bottom line is we never have really based this mm -hmm. on the upward side of the Eagleford. It's, it's been based on our norm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and you know, I happen to represent mm -hmm. Orange County, uh, working on a bond transaction for Judge Shaw. I stood up and gave them impassioned plea to be very cautious how they structure their debt because <coughs> their tax values have gone from less than half a billion to 3.3 billion in three years. And I, and I represent some West Texas counties where those oil values have been extremely volatile. I don't think Wilson County is in that same position because you've got such a small piece of your county that's in the Eagle for Shell that you're not seeing the great uptick that these other counties are, and consequently, you're not susceptible to the great downticks either. What, 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 I, what I have seen is that we've gone through two decades of significant growth. Mm -hmm. And when I look at, at the retiring of this debt, I really don't look at the evil for because if the evil for comes in, um, that's a plus. Mm -hmm. But when you've had two decades of 30% 
growth in our location. At least two decades. Yes, at least. Uh, our location to Barrett County, you would anticipate that the population growth is going to continue and that that is going to... to um, exactly. That's exactly what we were talking about when we had our, our business workshop in January, February. Is that I think the future of Wilson County is just not. I think the future of Wilson County is much more driven to it being a preferred residential subdivision right. of our county than it is being driven by Eagle for Shale. But in the past, what two years we haven't really had three years of really a, a, that growth in there yet. I mean, it's, I haven't seen big subdivisions coming in. Only the one that. Kevin has a it's, it's starting to pick up now. Mm -hmm. Many, many of those subdivisions wasn't built out, and their building is still continuing. Right, I know the buildings are still, but at the pace that we were going at one time, it was really picking up, up and up, and then all of a sudden it started decreasing. Well, and we had that problem nationally as a function of the subprime mortgage crisis back in, in, in 2009. We've only, and this is one of the leading economic indicators that I talked about, is causing interest rates to go up. It's just only in the 60, 90 days on a national level that we've seen housing really begin to mm -hmm. gain some strength. And that's part of what's driving interest rates up is that's housing picking up nationally. We, we have increasing core. We have two new subdivisions that are under construction and two existing subdivisions that uh, have opened or in the process of opening up new phases. Um, you know, as we talked earlier, this is mostly based on history, not the Eagle Beach. And you can't really promise the citizens this, but with the Eagle Beach's presence, we have a rail yard of a thousand acres going in between Tony Dark and Suspanto. We've got a refinery that's backed up now. We've got three of the cities of the four in the county that has industrial or business parks that's just overflowing. We've got a transfer station down near so there's a good possibility the tax rate will fall but from the new, but it, it, our debt is not dependent, or, or, or you know what I mean, in other words, if all that stuff wasn't happening, it would be stable as to where we're at. And, and these are numbers are based, these tax rate impacts are based on very modest uh, growth assumptions for, for those of the time. You know, Wilson County and, and in Floresville uh, in particular, really is in a tremendously fortuitous location because you've got some oil play in, in, in the, the edge of your county, but you've got rail, you've got interstate, you've got transportation uh, infrastructure that DeWitt County and Carnes County and, and these other counties don't have, which is exactly why, even though you don't have the oil, the refineries are located here and the rail yards are located here. And it, as production in DeWitt County Orange County fluctuate, what production is, is still being processed is coming to your capital intensive infrastructure in Wilson County. Uh, so it's a, uh, you know, you, you're, you're not going to see the growth that Carnes County is seeing in terms of tax values, but the growth that you do see is going to be much more stable than the growth that Carnes County is seeing. Exactly. It kind of on the light side, at, at a eight five million dollar back an individual from from uh, Carnes City, Carnes City was kidding with us and said, we just may just succeed in this out there because we've got all this growth and, and money. I said, well, all of you should have a plaque that we once had you ring in. <laughs> and you should be nicer than that. Just as nice as you can be. So can we get a consensus to, uh, as to what, uh, Paul, what do you, you oh, I, I, I think we need to move forward before it gets too high. But Mr. Henderson, I just have a question though. If let's say we only use seven and a half million, we borrow eight and a half, we, so we're still stuck with eight and a half, even if we don't for ten years. For ten years, for right? Ten years. Right. No. Now, unless, as, as the judge says, we broaden the stated uses, because we could actually include county roads in the description, so we could broaden the, the stated uses. And if there's a million, you know, if you only need, you know, these bids come in and say a million, well, that gives you a million to go do other things with, that's option one, is do other things that you've stated and then notice that, you know, that you told the citizens to do. The second thing is put it in the interest and sinking fund account 
and you can either subsidize the INS tax rate, which is a fancy word for saying lower the tax rate and effectively give the money back to the taxpayers, or you could hold it in the INS account rate until the 10 years is up and then pay the debt off early then. So there's multiple alternatives for dealing with, with leftover money. Now the other thing though is, is that based on the timing of these bids coming in, we're not selling the debt until August of 12. What are the bids do? What? what are the bids do? That, that they, they advertise for bids, when, when, are, when are they do back in? I don't know. Uh, do you have a copy of it? Uh, I don't have a copy of it. Well, this is. I mean, it's before, somewhere in August. August. It's going to be. It's going to be before August. Yeah, I mean, hell yeah, we'll yeah. Say we'll say before August. Yeah. yeah, he was. I mean, yeah. So, yeah. So, so, two or three weeks before we actually sell this debt, you're going to know what those bids are, and you can decide at that point in time to only issue seven and a half million instead of eight. Now, yeah, the 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 only two that went out for bid was the criminal justice and the courthouse. The yeah. library itself is yeah. not. Okay. Not but those are the. The criminal justice thing, I think, is going to be the single largest cost. Right. Mm -hmm. So I mean, and if you add that in, in, in the courthouse, you're going to have you have a pretty firm number on yeah, seventy five percent of your project, right? Because we we issued the RFQs for um, the construction manager at risk for the justice center and the, the courthouse, but the, the library has not been included right now. So. So what, what do you need from us today? Just, uh, this is the informational item. There is no action item. What, what we'll do is uh, communicate with, with the judge and Verna uh, to define what the uses of the money would be. We will come back on June the 24th with an official action item to, to, to give notice of intent and authorize the publication of notice of intent. The commissioner's court at that time can definitively decide what number to put in that. And, and again, I would reiterate.